Hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. How are y'all doing tonight? It's Kelly and Vicki Reed here with Restoration Fellowship, just continuing on in our our uh, broadcast on the Omer count. So tonight is night six, six, six. in the Omer count. So uh, let's just say the blessing that goes with that and uh, be on our way on an exciting uh, and challenging topic for us tonight, that yes. of uh, replacement theology. If you're not as familiar with that, hopefully we'll have a better understanding and an idea of that by the time things are done. But today being day six of week one of the counting of the Omer. It says, Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kitshanu b'mitzvotav b'tzivanu al seferat haomer. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us by his commandments and commanded us about the counting of the Omer. Amen. And that's where we're at. All right. So yeah, tonight we're going to talk about replacement theology, which is a challenging um, topic. If you've never heard of replacement theology, if you've never studied replacement theology, you're going to be surprised at how pervasive it is in, in our theology. And it's actually a very dangerous um, part of our theology. Mm -hmm. so. Because at the heart of it is trying to make a distinction or a separation between uh, the what God has done in the past through the, the, the patriarchs, through the Old Testament yes. saints and such, and make a distinction between what he was doing there and what he started doing with uh, with Yeshua, with Jesus, and uh, making starting something completely new and some something completely different, moving forward from there. And so, trying to cr trying to create a distinction between what we call the Old Testament and the New Testament, as if. God is behaving in a new and different yeah. way, not consistent with what he had done before. And remember, we are talking about um, Messianic perspectives. And so within the Messianic understanding of things, there is not a page between the Old and the New Testaments. It is all one story. It is all God's story. And God did not change halfway through history and decide to take a new course. Mm -hmm. You know, we often say in the church that uh, Yeshua, Jesus, was not plan B. Mm -hmm. That he was God's plan from the beginning. Well, if he's God's plan from the beginning, then God was setting up things all along the way that would lead to him. He did not have an entirely different system of faith in the what we call the Old Testament. Uh, that he does in the New Testament. So, And you think of where we are now, we are much more like, in many ways, the the Old Testament saints of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and, and them than, than the, the people that were living and existing in the days of Yeshua. And I, I mean that in this sense, that all of the promises that God had made to the patriarchs to, to them in the Old Testament. They were looking forward yes. to Messiah. They were looking forward to seeing those days. You know, Jesus himself says, Yeshua says, you know, Abraham looked forward to seeing my day. He saw it and was glad. So he was looking forward to these promises about the Messiah coming, but he himself, you know, didn't live it, didn't experience it, was not there for those events. And yet... Um, it was still a, a believing moment. He was trusting in what God was going to do. And at the same time, we, and in our current context, now we were not there either. Uh, we were not there to see those things, but what are we doing? We are looking back and trusting in what God has done in the fulfillment of the promise. We are both, both the Old Testament saints of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all of them, and the prophets and such, we're looking forward to the coming of Messiah. We, here where we are, are looking back to what the coming of Messiah. We're both looking at exactly the same thing. We're both looking and trusting in the exact same moment with the understanding that there is another coming in fulfillment of that. And, you know, we see that 
uh, in the in the book of First Peter, you know, he said he says this to this generation that was there, but uh, might have lived at the time, but they they weren't there in Jerusalem at the time. He says in First Peter chapter one verse eight, he says, "Though you have not seen him, you love him, and even though you don't see him now, you trust him." and are filled with a joy that is glorious beyond words, receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Uh, and that's, that's a description that is fitting for both the, the Old Testament saint and believer as much as the modern New Testament believer. He goes on to say, the prophets who spoke about the grace that was to be yours searched for this salvation and investigated carefully. They were trying to find out the time and the circumstances, the, the Ruach of Messiah, the spirit of Messiah within them was indicating when predicting the sufferings in store for the Messiah and, and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were providing these messages, not to themselves, but to you. These messages have now been announced to you through those who proclaim the good news to you by the Ruach HaKodesh through the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, and for even angels long to catch a glimpse of these things. So the, all the guys in the Old Testament were looking forward to the coming of Messiah, but they weren't there to see it with their own eyes, and we weren't there either. So we're both trusting in the same thing, and to create a separation uh, and a distinction saying, well, they were believing and trusting in something else, which is what replacement theology ultimately does, is creating a separation and a dichotomy in the work of God that does not exist in Scripture. And it's very important to remember as well uh, that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Mm -hmm. Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the Word of God stands forever. That's right. All these, you know, God is eternal. His word is eternal. And his word does not change. Um, so, yeah, let, we're going to dive in literally into a definition here. So you want to take Yeah, that? so uh, I was going to look at, a, uh, looked at a couple of sources here for, for defining what is, um, what is replacement theology. And I'm, right now I'm looking at uh, gotquestions.org which is a pretty common site that a lot of people look at. It, and it, so the question was, what is replacement theology? Replacement theology, also known as supersessionism, which is a nice fancy word, essentially teaches that the church uh, has, re and that by that they typically mean the Gentile church, right. uh, essentially teaches that the church has replaced Israel in God's plan. Adherents of replacement theology believe the Jews are no longer God's chosen people and God does not have specific future plans for the nation of Israel. Among the different views of this of the relationship between the church and Israel are, the, are and there's three of them here, and you might find yourself somewhere on this spectrum and what you grew up with or what you're familiar with. I know I find myself on here of uh, what I grew up with. Um, he says... Uh, among these different views, the relationship between the church and Israel are the church has replaced Israel, which is replacement theology. The church is an expansion of Israel, which is what's more formally known as covenant theology. And I'm not quite sure what they mean by expansion of Israel, but in other words, that it is expanded to include us or include the Gentile church but it still changes enough to where it is it is no longer about them. Uh, and then the last one says, or the church is completely different and distinct from Israel and God's purpose, his, his plan, his, his destination, so to speak. And that's uh, identified by God questions as dispensationalism or premillennialism. That's the one I grew up with. Mm -hmm. um, but so it teaches that replacement theology teaches that the church is the replacement for Israel and that the many promises made to, in, to Israel in the Bible are going to be fulfilled in the Christian church and not in Israel literally. So that's, that's the definition on, uh, on got questions.org and of course you know a lot of people go to this this to look for answers and they have a lot of good things on their their website they have a lot of things that 
I, I, I have issues with these days. And of course, I always want to encourage you to uh, to write in your questions and your your issues or verses and things that you want us to try to address over the next uh, 44 days now uh, of the counting of the Omer. And uh, you always go to our website, www.restorationmessiah.com. You can see some of our services, our messages, and and uh, other things like that. But so that's that's how Got Questions addressed replacement theology. Mm -hmm. uh, I was going to go to another spot just to hear it again. Um, this is, uh, if you've heard of Mark Biltz and El Shaddai Ministries, this is referring to them. Uh, this is how they have a, a sheet on their website. It says, Replacement Theology teaches that when it comes to the promises of God in Scripture, the church has replaced Israel. In this doctrine, the church views Israel as the branch that was broken off, mm -hmm. referred to in Romans chapter 11, verse 20. And the Gentile church, now being grafted into the olive tree, has replaced the branch of Israel. So in replacement theology, the Jewish people have no future in God's plan as a, as a people. Uh, replacement theology, theology falsely teaches that the church has taken the place of Israel. And, and when we get to it in a little while, uh, I'm going to read some quotes from history that uh, what we typically call the early church fathers, uh, some of the things that they have said about Israel, some of the things they've said about the Jewish people, uh, and it will, in, and this is just a small sample, by the yes, way, it is. but it will shock you. It will absolutely shock you. And one thing I think that we have to remember, the definition he just read sounds like it could be right. Because we know Romans 11 says that they were broken off and we were grafted in. But the problem is that's been taken a lot out of context and used and twisted to, to completely take Israel out of the picture. Mm -hmm. To completely take the natural branches out of the picture. And that is extremely dangerous. You know, whereas, yes, in the days after uh, Yeshua's resurrection, those who came to follow him, those who came to believe in him, for quite a while were all Jews. Mm -hmm. They were all Jews. The entire believing community was Jewish. And it wasn't until a little later that the Gentiles started being grafted in. I mean, that was the big debate in the early, in the book of Acts and right. such. You know, when you get to the day of Pentecost and 3,000 people believe and, and more were added to their number daily, those were all Jewish people. And that did not change until, uh, until the Samaritans started being added in. And that was a controversial a moment yeah. for the church. They did, they weren't sure exactly how to handle it with, with Stephen and such. And then it was even a greater controversy in so Acts. That was Philip. That was Philip. You're right. It was. Um, um, it was even in greater controversy in Acts chapter 10 when Peter had that vision mm -hmm. from the Holy Spirit to go to Cornelius yes. and, and start preaching mm -hmm. to, to outright, you know, um, you know, the Samaritans at least were partially related. They at least had the script, you know, uh, the Samaritan Pentateuch and some other things like that. Uh, so they were related. They were kind of a, the the half cousin type of thing or whatever. But they were going to Cornelius. They were going to the Romans. They were going to the non-Jews, the people who were just visiting and, and had moved there. And that was a major controversy because there were, there were two schools of thought. You want to tell them about that, about... The inclusion of the Gentiles. You mean in terms of Hillel, how? Hillel and Shammai. Oh, wow. In terms of Hillel and Shammai, this is really interesting. Hillel believed that Gentiles did have a place in the kingdom to come and could come to faith in the one true God. Shammai, on the other hand, which was the predominant school of thought in the days of Yeshua and definitely the apostles, uh, he believed that no, 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 no. Gentiles have no place. Their only hope is conversion to become a Jew. And then. And then they can, you know, have a place in the kingdom to come. But 
so, so that's what we see in Acts 15, really. We, mm-hmm. we see the discussion of what does it take for a Gentile to have a place in the kingdom to come? What does it take for a Gentile to be a part of this believing community? Do they have to convert to Judaism first and legally and become a legal Jew first? That's the whole circumcision question. Or can they come to faith in Yeshua as they are and then grow in their faith? Mm -hmm. And if you'll, you'll see these interactions, even in the lives of the apostles, Mm -hmm. the apostle Paul was a student of Gamaliel and Gamaliel himself was a, a grandson of Hillel. Yes. So he, he had the perspective, Paul had the perspective of the school of Hillel. Uh, the more popular opinion of Shammai was something that you can see that Peter struggled with. Mm-hmm. Peter seemed to really struggle with and have that attitude toward the Gentiles of they, they're not welcome, they're not included. And so the Spirit of God had to speak directly to him and, and reveal these things to him. And it was so controversial even for him. But later on, you know, as as you know, people from Jerusalem show up in Galatia. Uh, Peter then later begins to withdraw and pull back away from all of these Gentiles that uh, that are that he is fellowshipping with, and uh, and that's where you see that confrontation between Paul and Peter. And and Paul says, you know, I I spoke out to his face. Even and, though Peter was the one that had the vision yeah. in Acts 10 and was the first one to cross that line with Cornelius. Yes. So, and this is, I want to read Ephesians chapter 2 because this is this is a bit of that discussion. Because again, in the early church, it wasn't about uh, a separating Jews from Gentiles and, and things of that. It was a, can the Gentiles be included at all? And replacement theology has taken that in the other direction to say, well, the Jews don't have a place at all. Right. Um, But this is Ephesians chapter 2. He says, Therefore, keep in mind that once you Gentiles in the flesh were called uncircumcision by those called circumcision, which is performed on flesh by hand. Okay, so again, that's that issue of conversion. The circumcision was more the term used to talk about a legal conversion to Judaism. Um, But he says, At that time, you Gentiles... You were separate from Messiah. You were excluded from the commonwealth of Israel. You were strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was our Mm. circumstance. That was our condition as Gentile. And Paul then gives this great news to the Gentiles in the very next verse. He says, but now, this is Ephesians 2.13, in Messiah Yeshua, you who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. So all those things that he just said about your previous condition have been switched, have been changed. So now you're you are you were you're not separate from Messiah anymore. You're not excluded from the Commonwealth of Israel anymore. You're not strangers to the covenants of promise anymore. You have hope now. You have God now. That's what he is saying to us. To the point that he gets down to verse nineteen. To where he says, so then you are no longer strangers and foreigners. Strangers and foreigners to what? To to the nation, to the people of Israel. Yes. You're no longer considered an outsider right. to Israel. Right. Uh, but you are fellow citizens with God's people, that's the Jewish people, and members of God's household. And that's a very important word we're probably not going to get into tonight. But uh, you have been built on the foundation made up of the apostles and the prophets. So going back to what the, the faith that they were teaching and, and preaching all along through the scriptures, uh, with Messiah Yeshua himself being the cornerstone, being the focus of it all. In him, the whole building being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple for the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into God's dwelling place in the the Ruach, in the Spirit. So now that we have become in Messiah, Mm -hmm. even Gentiles are being fitted into their right place within this uh, this holy temple for the Lord. And that was a a major breakthrough. It sure was. Because even Yeshua talked about... 
only coming for the lost sheep of Israel. Even Yeshua talked about the Gentiles liking to lord it over the Jewish people. And what's sad, you know, you, you, you talked about replacement theology reversing what was happening in, in the first century. You know, it was no longer the question, what do we do with these Gentiles? The question became, what do we do with the Jews? Mm -hmm. And we see that even in the book of Third John. In the book of Third John, there is a leader of a church who wants nothing to do with John, who wants nothing to do with those that are with John, other Jewish believers, and even wants to kick people out of the congregation who want to let John and other Jewish believers in. So we're already seeing by the end of the first century, we're seeing this anti-Semitic perspective come up within the congregations. And I think it's very important to remember that church is the word in Greek called ecclesia. And that word ecclesia goes back again. Remember, we talked about the Septuagint the other night. That word um, what is ecclesia, the Septuagint? What is the, the Septuagint? Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And so and it was, and it was it written came... be, way before Jesus was born, before Yeshua was born. And so... And it goes back to the Septuagint. The Septuagint used that word ecclesia, and it used that word ecclesia to translate the word call, which means assembly, mm -hmm. okay, or congregation. Okay, and, and that's that's very important because we 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 have to remember that. Just because the New Testament is written in Greek and just because we speak English, sometimes we have to trace things back. Mm -hmm. Because the Jewish people had already wrestled with the, the idea of translating. What? Yes. How do we bring these Hebrew words and these Hebrew concepts into the Greek language? They had already done that. And that was the, the Septuagint was, what, 200 years before yes. Christ? Yes. yes, So for 200 years, they had been already using certain Greek words for certain Hebrew words. And they were then therefore already uh, accepted and, and used as equivalents. So again, ecclesia, what we typically translate as church, has already been in use for 200 years by the Jewish people as a, a word, the word assembly, as the word congregation, the words that they had been using throughout the Torah, throughout to the prophets to describe the people of Israel. Yes. And so, we think we yeah. come along in the New Testament oh, and Ecclesia is a, is a brand new word in a whole brand new thing as if this just burst onto the scene in Acts chapter 2. No. And, and that's not what they meant. And then we come to, we talked about this the other night too, then we come to Acts chapter 7 and we see in the King James, we see Stephen re refer to the congregation of Israelites in the wilderness as the church. Mm-hmm. Well, that's confusing if we don't realize that that's exactly how the Septuagint talked about them. Mm -hmm. And so, again, that was already an accepted word for the congregation of Israel 200 years before the time of Yeshua the Messiah. Mm -hmm. And so replacement theology comes along and wants to create a distinction and, and wants to teach that the church is something different. The church is something new. Uh, that God had not been doing this all along. God had not been preparing and making a people, a distinct people for his own. Uh, and to believe and trust in the Messiah. Now, obviously, granted, um, you know, at the beginning of, you know, in the first days of the church, you know, most of the believers were Jewish. Mm -hmm. But once it once it broke that barrier to the Gentiles, yes, there was an explosion in the Gentiles. And so, now, see, even just using the word church there, it conveys that idea that there's a separation. And that's what we've done. Got I got him. That's what we've done. We have taken and we've we've made a separation between what God was doing in what we call the Old Testament and what we call the New Testament. And we, we use it like this. Today we live in the age of grace. Mm -hmm. And back then they lived in the age of law. 
And we separate those two things as if God was not gracious to his people all the way back there. But if you go back and you read the Torah, if you read the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you'd be surprised how often God mentions his grace or his favor. And by the way, in Hebrew, that comes from the exact same word, Mm -hmm. okay, or equivalent words. So and we see the favor of God or the grace of God all throughout the Torah, all throughout the Old Testament. God trying to reach out to his people and say, my people, come, let's reason together, come back to me, come back to me, I am here, I want to be your God. And that's still what he is saying to us today. He wants to be our God. He he provided everything that was needed. And yet, how many times do we grieve? Does our heart grieve over what is happening in the church? (laughs) Because we see people walking away from the Lord. We see uh, the devotion that people have for God becoming less and less and less. Well, if it grieves us, do we not think it grieves our Heavenly Father? Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things, creating this separation Uh, between what the people or the congregation in the old and the congregation now in the new in Messiah, Mm -hmm. you know, it contributes to one of those charges that I remember hearing in college that, you know, we, it's like the Bible is about two different gods. There's a God of the old Testament and there's a God of the new Testament. And so they're, they're, it's like they operate in completely different ways. They have completely different nature. They have a completely different, um, um, Oh, I just lost my train well, of thought. Well, God in the Old Testament is it all about is judgment, law and wrath, judgment, and, yeah. and, and the, the God of New Testament, Testament is Yeshua, grace. Jesus is, is love. He's love. He loves us. Well, God the Father loves us too, or he wouldn't have sent the Son. Mm-hmm. And so that, that was there all but along. Replacement theology contributes to that. Yes, and it wants to separate it. And so I was going to say that with with the with the Gentiles with the explosion among the Gentiles, uh, you had all of these people that were coming into the body of Messiah, uh, who didn't have you know, the the connection to the past. They didn't know the the stories of the Passover. They they never found their connection to those things. It was all foreign to them. They were having to learn an entire new way of life, an entire new culture, an entire new way of worship from what they were used to. And so as as the hostility then between uh, the, the Jewish people who accepted the Messiah uh, grew, uh, and spe- even over the issue of all of these Gentiles coming to believe and showing up in the synagogue to hear the Torah, um, mm-hmm. You know, as that hostility increased, then the animosity between the two groups increased. And so uh, the old hatreds that that Yeshua came to tear down, the wall of separation between Jew and Gentile that he wants to get rid of, uh, started rearing itself up again. And it became ingrained even in our theology as the centuries developed in church history. And it became worse and worse and worse to where, as replacement theology developed, that it's no longer, what do we do with the Gentiles coming? Mm -hmm. It then becomes, what do we do with all these Jews that are still out there? Yeah, these Jews are a problem. And so why don't we go ahead and go and and let's, let's read some quotes of some of the church fathers up through even some of the reformers. Um... Y'all, you're going to be surprised. I know the first time I heard these, I was like, oh my goodness. I had no idea. I had no idea that the heart of these men that we were taught to respect and honor and revere had such hate in their hearts Mm -hmm. for Yeshua's relatives. Mm -hmm. And, And remember when... When he comes back and he separates the sheep goats from the the, The sheep sheep nations from the goat nations is what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. 
that he's going to do it on the basis of how these nations treated his family. Not just those who believed in him, but even his physical family. Mm -hmm. He's going to hold nations to account for how they treated the sons and daughters of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm -hmm. And so the, and these are early church fathers that are part of our church history classes, part of our systematic mm -hmm. theology books. Where they have incredible writings and treatises on doctrine and on important doctrine mm -hmm. uh, that establishes some, some truths that we still hold as believers in Messiah. But they, they tend to skip over and leave out these parts that make them not look so good. Right. And again, this is just a small selection of, of what is out there and some of the things that they said. So I'm going to start AD 160. So you're talking uh, a little over 120, 130 years after uh, the, the resurrection of Messiah. Justin Martyr. Do y'all know his name? He's a big one. And so he says, in speaking to a Jew... So he's having a conversation or he's writing letters or something. He says, the scriptures are not yours, but ours. They no longer belong to you. And keep in mind, the scriptures at that time was not the New Testament. The New Testament had not been codified yet. So the scriptures he's directly referring to is the Old Testament. The Tanakh. The Tanakh. Mm -hmm. the, the scriptures that the Jews had had for over a thousand years, the Torah itself. He's saying, that's not no longer yours, that's ours. Mm -hmm. So the next one I have is Irenaeus, the Bishop of, of Lyon uh, in uh, AD 177, uh, stated that the Jews are disinherited from the grace of God. You no longer Period. have a place. Uh, Tertullian is a name that uh, you may know. He lived from 160 to about 230. He said he had an entire article or a treatise, as it's called, named against the Jews. And he announced that God had rejected the Jews in favor of the Christians. And by that, he means the Gentiles. Yeah, keep in mind, again, the first believers were... Jews. All Jewish. Thousands and thousands of Jews. And so, it, and it wasn't until later that believers started to be called Christians. And, and mm -hmm. that was an insult. And they were still Jews at the time. And they were still Jews at the time, or, or largely, largely Jewish at that point. And, and yet, the word Christian somehow started to become more connected with Gentile believers. Mm-hmm. So there's another one in the early 4th century. So you're talking in the early 300s. Mm -hmm. A man named Eusebius wrote that the promises, and um, this is not a direct quote, but the promises of the Hebrew scriptures were for Christians and not for the Jews, but the curses were for the Jews. So it's, uh, in other words, the, the Christians get all the good stuff mm -hmm. and all the, the judgment, all the wrath, all the curses, that gets poured out on the Jews because they deserve it. That's essentially what he's arguing. He argued that the church was the continuation of the Old Testament, thus superseding Judaism. The young church declared itself to be the true Israel, or Israel according to the spirit and heir to the divine promises. Uh, so they found it essential to discredit the Israel according to the flesh. Yes. So they have to remind everyone and demonstrate that they are not worthy of the grace of God and such. So they had to prove that God had cast away his people and transferred his love to the new uh, Gentile Christian church. Um, you know, there's a lot that can be said about, uh, and a lot of people do make things about Constantine, the first you know, Christian Roman emperor. Uh, you know, and he makes the Christianity, the official Roman, em the religion of the empire. And yet, eight, hold on a second. We've, we've read a lot that were be just now that were before Constantine. Yes. So these things were already being done, even though there were still large numbers of Jews mm -hmm. who were believers. And uh, and so he uh, he excluded all other religions. They signaled the end of the persecution of Christians, but the beginning of discrimination of pers against, persecution against the Jewish people. And, uh, you know, we see that in some of these things about uh, the declarations about the Sabbath. I mean, they made it illegal, not it, they made it illegal to to keep and observe the Sabbath. In fact, they even made it to the point where you had to 
make you work. Yes. You, it was against the law not to work on the, the, the Sabbath. And so they made it illegal to befriend and be friends with Jewish people, to conduct business with them and such as that. Um, let's see. Um, again, this is, I'm looking at a few things off of uh, a, an article on El Shaddai Ministries and such. They, the discussion about Passover and uh, the connection to separating mm -hmm. Passover from Easter. <clears throat> They, they thought the whole method of the biblical calendar and the, the calculation of when Passover takes place didn't make sense. It didn't uh, make sense to them. To them, because again, they didn't grow up in the system. And then there's this whole concept of the second Passover, uh, which I talked about, what, uh, yeah, two weeks we've ago? Talked, we've talked about that. Two weeks yeah. ago uh on shabbat and how how actually that was a very necessary thing yes um but um won't get on to that but it said he says there at the council of nicaea that in rejecting their custom we may transmit to our descendants the, the legitimate mode of celebrating easter we ought not therefore to have anything in common with the jew for the Savior has shown us another way, our worship following a more legitimate and more convenient course. And of course, convenience really? seems to be the issue. Yes. Because they wanted it to be convenient that they should all keep the feast on one day and it would be the same, you know, same day, you know, be consistent every year. You know, in a way a Roman could understand it. In a way it. a Roman could understand it. So that they could have a more legitimate and convenient course or the order of the days of the week. So uh, unanimously adopting this mode, we desire, dearest brethren, to separate ourselves from the detestable company of the Jew. For it is truly shameful for us to hear them boast that without their direction, we could not keep this feast. And what he's referring to there is that uh, the beginning of the month, you know, the first month on the, on the biblical calendar is started by the sighting of the new moon. Mm -hmm. And that was done in Jerusalem. And so the sighting of the new moon starts day one, and then on the 14th day of that month is when Passover takes place. And yet, even... Rome the, didn't want to wait for that declaration. Well, even even in, at this point, the Hillel calendar is pretty much already in place. Yeah, that's true. You know, it already began... But it was so, a Jewish calendar. Yeah. So, it is truly shameful for us to hear them boast that without their direction, we could not keep the feast. In other words, it'll be at a different time. And he says, uh, da, 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 da. they frequently celebrate two Passovers in the same year. We could not imitate those who are openly in error. <laughs> and what's, what's so funny about that is that that provision about the second Passover is explicitly mentioned in scripture. And it's a provision that the Lord gave to mm -hmm. those who were contaminated by a dead body in the wilderness and that dead body that they're like the tradition says the dead body they're referring to are the bones of joseph that they're carrying out of egypt and so they go to moses and ask him you know about celebrating the passover they want to celebrate the passover why can't they celebrate the passover and moses says okay wait a minute let me go talk to god and see what he says yeah and that's in numbers chapter nine by the way and so the directive for the second passover comes directly from god mm -hmm. and so you see here constantine basically calling god not so smart yeah Saying that God is in error. So, as, and as part of that same announcement, this is again, this is the Council of Nicaea in about 325. Uh, it says, How then could we follow these Jews who are most certainly blinded by error? For to celebrate a Passover twice in one year is totally inadmissible. But even if this were not so, it would still be your duty not to tarnish your soul by communication with such wicked people. The Jews. Yeah. So you should not consider, you should consider not only that the number of churches in these provinces make a majority, but also that it is right to demand that our reason approves and that we should have nothing in common with the Jews. Now, wait a minute. Nothing in common? Nothing in common. Nothing in common. Well, if we have nothing in common with the Jews, then we have nothing in common with Jesus or Yeshua. Mm -hmm. Because he was a Jew mm -hmm. and he lived as a Jew and so did the apostles. So if we have nothing in common with the Jewish people, then we've cut ourselves off from all of that. Mm -hmm. 
And it, it struck me in reading some of these things like that and researching this, you know, about the Sabbath and the change from Sabbath to Sunday and such, you know, and this is in the middle 300s and such, that uh, they they not only, you know, make the change, but they also order everybody to stop celebrating the Sabbath. And it struck me, it's like, well, why would they need to say that if this was a universal agreed upon, yeah, we're already doing this anyway. You know, if they were already all keeping the the Sunday day of worship, then there would be no need to make a statement about, okay, you have to stop worshiping on Saturday now. Right. Uh, it's kind of like, and the, the way I liken it is this, you know, if you have a, uh, a freeway and you put up a sign on the freeway saying, you know, speed limit uh, 75 miles an hour, and some of you in Texas get to see those nice 80 <laughs> mile an hour signs and such. But um, but imagine the why would you need to put up a sign that says speed limit eighty miles an hour if you're still uh, using a, a, a horse and a buggy and a cart and the maximum any of those things could ever go is thirty thirty five miles an hour if you don't even have the means of going eighty miles an hour why would you ever put up a sign that says speed limit eighty. And I, I liken that to in the sense of why would they would never need to make a statement about stop keeping the Saturday Sabbath if people weren't <laughs> still keeping the Saturday Sabbath in the 300s. And so that means that was still going on. That was still mm -hmm. a practice that was happening that they tried to put a stop to. By force. By force. By the force of law. By the enforcement mm -hmm. of the government. Mm -hmm. And, of course, that's a that's a dangerous situation. But that's that's not how we have typically been oh, presented. Oh, but wait a minute. Wait a minute. Aren't we, today, with what's going on right now, aren't some of us kind of concerned about what some governments in our country on the local level are doing to churches hmm. hmm telling them they can't go telling them they can't do this you know how do we feel about that how do we feel about that right. <laughs> so uh so again those those are just some of the uh the uh statements out here here's another one from the again from the fourth century the bishop of antioch so uh, clearly a leader within the church this is john uh, Chrysostom, the golden tongue, as he is called, he's a, well known as a great orator and writer. He wrote a series of eight sermons against the Jews. Eight. To quote him, uh, the synagogue is not only a brothel and a theater, it is also a den of robbers and a lodging for wild beasts. No Jew adores God. Jews are inveterate murderers possessed by the devil their debauchery and drunkenness gives them the manners of the pig huh, yeah he was eating the pig. and you can wonder i mean if, if you're hearing some of these things is it any doubt that there is hostility or at mistrust from the the jewish community to the believing uh especially the christian church tradition in the history of the church and think about this for a second this is an antioch you remember antioch this is where Paul and Barnabas were first stationed. This is, this is the congregation that sent out Paul and Barnabas to Jews. Mm -hmm. And that congregation at the time was mostly Jews, mm -hmm. if not all Jews. They were meeting in the synagogue. And so it's that, that city the believers that are now mostly Gentiles in that city that are saying this about the Jews. Well, again, if you're saying that you're the Bishop of Antioch, then you're saying that about your founders, the people who were bedrocks in your history. And the reason why they are saying this, the, the foundation for how they are saying this is the replacement theology. Yes. It's this understanding that God is done with them. He is cast them aside they have been cursed by god because they rejected or killed jesus that's something that augustine said he had a sermon a sermon against the jews uh he says that even though the jews deserved the most severe punishment for having killed our jesus they that they have been kept alive by divine providence to serve together with their scriptures as a witness to the truth of christianity um you know in Martin Luther, here's, here's... Hold on just a oh. second. Hold on just a second. Because 
I think we need to stop for a second. And so what we see is that there is already a big break between Judaism and Christianity on at least part uh, part of part way on anti-semitic grounds yes. and theological grounds yes and so you you have these this the separation and yes they would bicker back and forth and no the jews who did not believe in yeshua were not always kind to those who did obviously um but there seemed to be this understanding with replacement theology that when a Jew believed in Yeshua or believed in Jesus, that automatically they left everything Jewish. They stopped being a Jew. They stopped being a Jew. Well, wait a minute. Is is that not the exact opposite of the conversation that they were having in Acts 15? How do we, what do we do with these Gentiles? Do we make them stop being Gentiles? Do we make them become a legal Jew? Do we make them legally convert in order to believe in our King and our Messiah? Well, now at this point that Kelly's talking about, it's the exact opposite. No, these Jews who come to believe, they, Can they, they can't believe in our Messiah. They're not, they're, they're leaving being Jewish. They are, in essence, converting to Christianity or converting to Gentile faith. And wow, what a dichotomy. Mm -hmm. What a problem. And so th that in that replacement theology context of, of the church, the Gentile church replacing and, and getting all of the promises and the Jewish people getting all the curses is the foundation for a lot of our theology, a lot of our uh, beliefs, you know, have that as a as an undertone within so much of it, uh, so much for uh, so much so to the point that when you get to Martin Luther in the Reformation, you know, he started out, uh, you know, in breaking away from the Catholicism and such. He was thinking we have now entered into a new era. And, uh, and man, now that we've broken away from some of the abuses, now the Jewish people are just going to come flocking to um, this faith in Messiah Yeshua or in Jesus and such. And, and it didn't happen. And there's a lot of reasons for that. But, you know, in a lot of ways, you know, the, the, the Jesus we were telling them about was still a very Gentile person and not a, a Jewish Messiah. And that that has a lot of issues, which we'll get into at some point or another. But by the end of his, you know, he was hoping that that would happen at the beginning. But by the later part of his life, when he had seen them not convert and leave Judaism behind, he became very hostile uh, to uh, to the Jewish people, and and ingrained again that attitude of replacement theology in some of his writings. He has an entire. And so as, as Kelly reads this, I want you to see. I want you to listen for what this sounds like that we are completely aware of. Mm -hmm. So he has a message entitled the Jews and their lies. Uh, he says, what shall Christ we Christians do with this rejected and condemned people, the Jews, since they live among us, we dare not tolerate their conduct. Now that we are aware of their lying and reviling and blaspheming. If we do, we become sharers in their lies, cursing and blasphemy. Thus, we cannot extinguish the unquenchable fire of divine wrath of which the prophets speak, nor can we convert the Jews. So they've given up on evangelism. Mm -hmm. uh, with prayer and the fear of God, we must practice a sharp mercy to see whether we might save at least a few of them from the glowing flames. We dare not avenge ourselves. Vengeance a thousand times worse than we could wish them already has them by the throat, and I shall give you my sincere advice. In other words, they started. He's he's proclaiming that the, the the his followers should become the agents and instruments of God's wrath to inflict upon them. So his his agents of judgment. So he's going to describe his sharp mercy. Mm -hmm. So first it is to set fire to their synagogues or schools and to bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn so that no man will ever again see a stone or cinder of them. Um, I'm going to skip some of these things. 
Uh, for whatever we tolerated in the past unknowingly, and I myself was unaware of it, it will be pardoned by God. Second, I advise that their houses also be razed or burned and destroyed, for they pursue in them the same aims as in their synagogues. Um, third, I advise that their prayer books and writings, Talmudic writings, in which such idolatry, lies, cursing, and blasphemy are taught to be taken from them, uh, fourth, I advise that their rabbis be forbidden to teach, henceforth on pain of loss of life or limb. Life or limb. For they have justly forfeited their right to such an office by holding the poor Jews captives with the sayings of Moses. Hold on a second. <laughs> Captive with the sayings of Moses. Yeshua himself said that Moses wrote about him, and in the Torah, in the books of Moses, it is God who is doing the speaking. Moses is this the one giving the message that God told him to give to the people. Mm -hmm. So whose sayings are uh, they? Is he condemning there? Yeah. Uh, he says, fifth, I advise that safe conduct on the highways be abolished completely for the Jews, for they have no business in the countryside since they are not lords, officials, tradesmen, and the like. Let them stay at home. Let them stay home. You mean the homes they, they were... Told to burn. burn in number two, the second thing of advice he just gave. He said, burn them. And now he's saying, let them stay home. So what's going to happen to them? Uh, six, that uh, that um, interest or usury, usury be prohibited to them, which is, uh, that's a big issue of, you know, in the Old Testament, it says, you know, that the the people of God, Israel, does not lend at, at uh, interest or, or usury. To each other. Well, the Catholic Church took that same moniker, same law, canon law and such, and said that Christians cannot lend money at interest to other Christians. Uh, so <laughs> Guess that, who the bankers were. Yeah, all the bankers, you know, in that sense were Jewish because they were the, the Christian population was larger and they could lend at interest. So And those who were lending to the Jews were Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So they just he's he's suggesting put out the Gentile bankers, put them out of business. Mm -hmm. Which is part of the conspiracy theories that we hear a lot about today. Uh seventh, I commend putting a flail, an axe, a hoe, a spade, a distaff, or a spindle into the hands of young, strong Jews and Jewesses, and let them earn their bread in the sweat of their brow, basically making them like slaves. slaves. Uh, and that is, that's Martin Luther. That matter of fact, that's not just Martin Luther. That's the last thing he wrote about and preached about to our knowledge. Um, and I'm not just talking Kelly and I am talking to the knowledge of Christendom. Mm -hmm. So and scary. Those are, those kind of writings is what, you know, in centuries later, you know, that, that men like Hitler picked up on and said, yes, we need to continue this out to its logical conclusion and, and take care of and create a final solution. Yeah. This was, this was the, the, this is how Hitler presented the idea to the church. To the Lutheran mm -hmm. church, mm -hmm. especially. But yeah, I mean, cause he used the Lutheran church in Germany a lot. Mm -hmm. And of course, Bonhoeffer, was in that tradition in that tradition and very much against hitler and what he was doing to the church and how he was manipulating the church mm -hmm. so this is this has been a a a problem of our theology for centuries yes uh and it has been a problem that does not originate in the scriptures it's a problem that does not originate in the heart of god no it, it, it originates with the enemy who wants to keep the Jew and the Gentile divided because and enemies. and enemies to each other, because it's when we come together mm. and when we come together and we haven't talked about this as much yet, but we will as the one new man, which is the goal. Uh, then when that starts happening, then Satan truly knows that his time is short, that it's almost over for him because when we truly come together as the people of God, as Jew and Gentile, united as one nation under King Messiah, yeah. then then he's done. He does not have a chance. So as much as he can keep us in opposite corners, he's going to do it. Yeah, because he knows that once the bride has made herself ready, 
The king's coming. And and the, the relationship between Jew and Gentile is one of the key elements for demonstrating the maturity of the people of God, yes. demonstrating that the bride has made herself ready until we as the body of Messiah come together with the Jewish people in in Messiah. You know, once we start seeing that happen, which is again what we are have been seeing increasing mm -hmm. in the last 50 to 60 years. Yes. As more and more Jewish people come to faith in Messiah, as and more Jewish people in this last fifty to sixty years than since the first century. And guess what? They're, they they're not stopping being Jews either. No, they're not. They don't have to convert to Christianity. Christianity. They have to just have their eyes open to the identity of Messiah. Absolutely. There's a big difference in that. There sure is. So, this is this has been a, a major problem for us. In the in the body of Messiah, uh, replacement theology is is a killer for our understanding of the scriptures, our understanding of the future and the goal and where Messiah is taking us. And it's, a, it's a killer to understanding the kingdom because mm. this is not going to be the kingdom. No, replacement theology is not the kingdom. We do not have a different destiny as no. the people of God. No. We are not separate from them. He is moving all of us to the same place. Yes, and you know that's that's the danger of dispensationalism. It wants to say that the church is in one place and then Israel is in another. They'll respect the fact that Israel is once again a nation. They respect the fact a lot of times that you know the Jewish people have a right to their own nation. But at the same time, and they'll even respect the, the, the fact that they are physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But at the same time, dispensationalism wants to say that these two groups, the Jews and the believers, have completely different destinies. And we don't really ever meet. We don't ever come together uh, because God's not going to start working with the Jews again until the church is removed and, and raptured out. So in essence, Yeshua's prayer is never really completely realized. And yet, in Revelation chapter 10, verse 7, it says that right before the seventh trumpet is blown, that the mystery of God, the mystery of God is the one new man, that the mystery of God is finished, it's complete. That's defined by Ephesians. Right. So, you know, this idea of the Jew and the Gentile coming together... And being what God intended it to be from the beginning. And that, what, what does that look like? Well, what it looks like our rabbi, it looks like our king, and it looks like our Messiah. And what did he do? How did he live? That is key. That is key. You know, Paul also says in Ephesians that there's one faith, there's just one. And there, there had not been at that point a thing called Christianity for the Gentiles created yet. Mm -mm. There has not. There was first century Judaism with the corrections of Yeshua and the apostles. Mm -hmm. Or? <laughs> well, there, there was that, or there was paganism. Those were the only options they had um, in terms of, of the Gentile, well, let me let me rephrase that. You know, you had you had normative Judaism that didn't believe in Yeshua as Messiah. Then you had Judaism that did believe that Yeshua was the Messiah, and then you had paganism. Okay, so but the ones who are the nominative Jews and the believers that Yeshua is the King of the Jews were can still considered family. Mm -hmm. And they still function that way in the first century, especially up until the fall of the temple. Yes, very much so. And uh, we're also, this is, this is one of the, going to be a, a growing problem in, in our lives today, in the believing community today. And we're seeing it, this in, in the recent years with the rise of anti-Semitism, with the rise of attacks on synagogues, with the rise of attacks on the Jewish people and such. You're seeing that more and more. 
And it's going to be a major dividing issue within the, the what's called the church yeah. as we approach the, the end days, as we approach the tribulation period, because we are we are going to be divided over the the uh, the people of Israel. You know, we're, we're and you see that with the entire uh, boycott, divestment and sanction movement, BDS movement. Uh, that that's ongoing, you know, that's blaming Israel for everything over in the Middle East and everything is their problem. And if they would just get rid of Israel, then there would not be any more issues over there anymore. And so you see churches, denominations, whole leadership councils and things like that within different uh, different groups, all condemning Israel. Right. And so you're going to have segments of the of the body who are claiming both claiming to be lovers of Jesus, you're going to be have some of them that are going off in an increasingly anti-Semitic direction, and you're going to have some that are increasingly trying to support them. Uh, and so that's going to be a major divide for the body of Christ. That's going to be part of the falling away that is to come. And it's going to be over this issue of replacement theology. The more a denomination or a, a church structure has accepted the foundation of replacement theology, the more they're going to not want anything to do with Israel and the right. Jewish people. And so they're not going to be there for them uh, when when persecution comes. In fact, they might even be leading the charge. In some ways, yeah. And that's that's despicable. Very much so. Very so. much so. Yeah, I mean, we, we have to... We have to remember, again, the Jewish people is Yeshua's family. And their existence is a miracle. <sighs> These were his cousins, his aunts, his uncles, his, this was his family. You know, and, and when we walk all over the Jewish people, we are walking on his family. Yes, we are his family. We've been grafted into that family. But, and I've, I've said this before um, when we've had uh, group studies, but I want, I want you to stop and think for a minute. There is only one group of people in all of scripture that says, that talks about that one group of people, when he returns, all of them who are still alive will completely and totally believe in who he is. There's just one group. And it's not a Gentile group. It is the Jews. They will believe. They will say, Baruch HaBab Hashem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. They will welcome their king. Now, they may not be sure at this point if he's already been here or if he's coming for the first time. But when he does come, that's going to be made completely clear. And all of their... Doubt is going to go away. Yeah. yeah. So, and again, that, that idea of the mystery, this is where things are going. Uh, this is Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to start there. Uh, verse, uh, second part of verse 8. He says, In all wisdom and insight, he, and talking about God, made known to us the mystery of his will in keeping with his good pleasure that he planned in Messiah. The plan of the fullness of times is to bring all things together in the Messiah, yes. both things in heaven and things on earth, all in him. And then over in chapter 3, he says, For this reason I, Paul, am a prisoner of Messiah Yeshua for the sake of you Gentiles. Surely you have heard about the plan of God's grace given to me for you, that the mystery was made known to me. So he knows what the mystery is, and he's about to tell you. Uh, by he, the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I wrote briefly before. So he's already told him about it. When you read this, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Messiah. So that means if we're paying attention and we're reading the scriptures, we should know exactly what this mystery is. Um, but most of us don't. Uh, he says this, you should know and understand my insight into the mystery of Messiah which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed by the Ruach to his holy apostles, his, emissary, you know, his emissaries and prophets. This is Ephesians 3, verse 6. This mystery is that the Gentiles are joint heirs and fellow members of the same body. Right. 
and co-sharers of the promise in Messiah Yeshua through the good news. And I became a servant of the good news by the gift of God's favor given to me through the exercise of his power. Um, for the favor was given to me, the very least of his holy ones, his saints, to proclaim to the Gentiles the endless riches of the Messiah and to bring to light the plan of the mystery, which for ages was hidden in God who created all things, that the purpose is, is that through Messiah's community, his ecclesia, his kahal, his, his congregation, mm -hmm. through his community, I lost my place. The the multifaceted wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and the authorities in the heavenly places. So I mean this the mystery is all about not creating separate destinies, not creating separate peoples, but and people not working one at a time, but that he's working all things together to at the same time you know, there's a there may be a there may be a blindness, there may be a temporary blindness, but the the end of that is going to be. But it's temporary. It's temporary. He's going to be lifting that blindness as the times approach, and so we're both going to be moving. And we're seeing that being. Lifted. And we're seeing it. We're seeing that being That's lifted. That's what's happening. And, and so many in the church are just completely unaware that God is is doing it. Mm -hmm. That God is lifting that blindness off the Jewish people. Something he told us he would do 2,000 years ago, he is doing in our day. And, you know, it it, it might continue to come at a, tr at a small pace, at a slow pace. It might come start to come like an avalanche. Mm -hmm. But I want you to think about just the dichotomy between Acts 15 and the things that Kelly read today coming out of... <clears throat> the early church fathers and even up to Martin Luther. The decision of the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15 was to show grace, to truly be merciful to these Gentiles who were believing in their king, in mm -hmm. their Messiah, and to say, let's give this give them time to learn what God wants them to do. We may start by saying, okay, these things have to change immediately so that they can go into the synagogue and hear, did you hear what I said? So they can go into the synagogue and, Shema. and hear and Shema, the word of God, right? The Torah, especially the books of Moses and learn and grow in their faith. That, in comparison to what the quotes that Kelly was reading, that was the exact opposite. No, we're not going to be merciful at all. We're going to show God's wrath to these people. They deserve it. We're going to be as mean and ruthless as we can. And we think that might save some of them. Last time I checked, that doesn't work too well. well. That's not the kind of provoking to jealousy I think that Paul was calling I for. I don't think so either. But just the, the the huge shift from the decision of being gracious to the decision of being ruthless. Mm -hmm. And who was doing the decision making? In Acts 15, it was Jews. The ruthlessness were Gentile believers and leaders of the church. Mm-hmm. So to wrap things up, you know, yes. replacement theology is is a destructive and a poisonous theology. And it's part of our what we grew up with in ways that we may not even understand yet, but we have to recognize it and root it out in order for us to get back to the the true point and hope of the, the scriptures. And it's where embedded he's within us. our very way of thinking about scripture. Mm -hmm. It sure is. So it so, goes anyway. along with that discussion we had about the Western mindset and the Jewish mindset as well. Yes, it does. So. Okay, that's a whole lot. A whole lot. That's a whole lot of stuff. Thank you all for watching tonight. Thank you for being a part of it. Be sure and send you know, your feedback, questions, all those types of things here. And uh, let us know if there's something we need to talk about or clarify. Um, Feel free to share these. You know, my email address is Pastor Kelly at RestorationMessiah.com. That's also our website. Uh, so just send us some feedback and we'd love to hear from you again. We'll be here again tomorrow night at six o'clock and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Shalom. Shalom.